Greetings, everybody, and we are about to get started. Thanks for joining today's webinar on examining requirements for math teacher preparation. My name is Kendra, and I'm a community designer and manager here at 100K and 10. And before we get started, I wanted to share a quick overview of what 100K and 10 is. 100K and 10 is a network that unites the nation's top academic institutions, nonprofits, foundations, companies, and government agencies to recruit and retain 100,000 excellent STEM teachers in the United States. And as we work together towards this big goal, we're also addressing the underlying systemic challenges that have contributed to the shortage of STEM teachers nationwide. We call these systemic challenges the grand challenges. And if you're eager to learn more about the grand challenges and 100K and 10, I encourage you to visit our website, 100kn10.org. Today on this webinar, you will hear from two leaders in our network who have been working together on a 100K and 10 project team about a specific project they've developed and some research that they've done. And you'll also have the opportunity to connect with others. Project teams are 100, small groups of 100K and 10 partners and invited guests who collaborate on a discrete, time-bound project that addresses the grand challenges. Today's webinar is led by a project team that's been working together since the beginning of 2018. And they'll present their project in just a moment, but I want to cover some very quick housekeeping items before we dive in. So to all of you here today on the webinar, you have a role. <laughs> Your role is to uh, participate. We invite you to actively use the Zoom chat function um, to contribute questions and comments throughout uh, the presentation that this, pro this project team will be sharing with us today. And as a heads up, this webinar will be recorded and shared and we'll email that to you tomorrow. Uh, but just take care. Um, if the project team hosts invite you to unmute yourself, just keep in mind that it is being recorded so you might not want to share anything that isn't public knowledge yet. We'd love for you to help us with a favor and stay until the end of the webinar and help us complete a very short, under two minute feedback survey about your experience in joining us today. Um, and as a reminder, you will receive this recording of the webinar by email tomorrow. Um, and then in a few weeks, we'll also share the full output of the project that this project team worked on. If you have any questions at all, you can feel free to email me at Kendra at 100kn10.org or you can uh, write to any of us with 100K and 10 in our um, Zoom name into, in the chat where you can share it with everyone in the Zoom chat. So without further ado, I'd love to pass the mic to Dwayne and Gideon who are going to present their project and lead us through today's webinar. Thanks very much. Um, you've already seen the title of the webinar we're giving today, so I'm not gonna repeat it for you, but I'll let you know that I'm Gideon Weinstein. I'm from Western Governors University. And I started, I responded to 100K and 10's invitation to become a project team leader um, in late 2017. And we talked back and forth a little bit and decided it was worth throwing out a pitch and see if we could gather some members together. And I'll let Dwayne introduce himself. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Gideon. Um, I'm Dwayne Morgan. I am the P20 director at the University System of Maryland office. And um, uh, our interest in, you know, mathematics and in particular mathematics education um, is, is very significant here at the system because we prepare most of the teachers in the state of Maryland. And so when this opportunity came up to actually um, do a deep dive into uh, mathematics, outcomes and expectations for secondary teachers, um, we jumped at it and, and we were so fortunate to have uh, Gideon as our leader and of course the wonderful 100K and 10 staff um, just supporting us throughout this process. So um, thank you again for attending and we hope that this is a, a fruitful discussion today. I'd also like to mention two participants to our team, Sujin Choi and Cassie Davis. They provided some inspiration, some resources, and some of their experiences and other projects that were relevant, but did not continue with us into the data collection um, and analysis portion. But they were instrumental in getting us going. So I'd like to extend my thanks to them here. We're gonna um, first present our work and we invite you to interrupt in any way you want. 
we've made sure that we don't have a crowded agenda. So there's certainly time to chat back and forth. Um, use the chat first. If things seem complex, then let, we'll invite you to come off a of mute and uh, join with your voice, not just your text. Uh, we're gonna uh, discuss our results. And again, please con converse with us as much as you want. And in closing, um, 100K and 10 will have a survey for you. And if there are any final questions to get to before that, we'll take care of them then. So you can write your questions down and save them, or you can blurt them out. We invite <laughs> either kind of participation. So, uh, so what do we do? <laughs> Why do we do it? Um, I told you I was from, I'm from Western Governors University. Uh, that's an online institution. We have licensure in all 50 states and some territories. And so we get to see what different state requirements are. And we also have recently gone through CAPE accreditation. So we were comparing what we were seeing, the requirements we were meeting for various states to the requirements for CAPE accreditation. And um, we saw a huge amount of variation. And what that brought into my mind was, where's this variation come from? What is the decision-making process for figuring out what those requirements for math teacher preparation coursework are. So that was my burning question. That was what motivated me to take up 100K and 10's challenge to lead a team. Because I really wanted to know and I knew I wouldn't be able to figure it out alone. Um, I needed a team to help organize me and 100K to uh, help keep me moving forward. So the original intent was to figure out the design process. Um, what are the decision-making processes at local institutions or even state level that create the courses that go into a math major for teachers? Um, it turned out that we had an opportunity to, instead of looking at the input, the design stage, we had an opportunity to shift our focus to finding out about the output. And the way we handled that was to work with a survey of mathematics supervisors. So we created this survey together to probe all aspects of the math major for teachers. So there's content as well as pedagogy, as well as methods, as well as demonstration, teaching and field experiences. And we gave this uh, survey out. Uh, these supervisors are all from a, mid-Atlantic state with a diverse population. These different areas they supervised uh, ran a variety from urban to rural. And um, we asked these supervisors who amongst them had, I think it was something like, they'd supervised 1500 students over the last um, average of seven to 10 years. What we asked was for them to think about some of their newer teachers the ones who, whose teaching style was, I think, strongly influenced by the program that had prepared them, and also teachers that they'd gotten to know. So we really focused them on people they had a chance to really form some opinions of where their teaching came from. And we asked a lot of questions about the preparation that those teachers had gone through. Um, you can see an example, most of, most of the time we did a Likert style, uh, Likert style survey, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. And I just like to point out when you see lots of blue, that means that a lot of supervisors thought that was really, really important in the preparation of effective new mathematics teachers. Red is they agreed and the other colors are neutral through strongly disagree. So we're not gonna show you too many uh, bar charts like this, but when you do see them, just think about how much blue and how much red, and you'll get a feel for the amount of agreement uh, that was going on. Here's three questions that came up that we saw by the way they evaluated the Likert scale results and by the comments and suggestions they made for 
what's missing in most programs? What do these new teachers need more of? Um, how can things be improved? They had three kind of blunt and rather simple questions. Uh, their language was more sophisticated, but we wanted to get across what they were really worried about, which is why don't these new teachers know assessment? Why do these new teachers lecture so much? And why did they have to take so many math classes in their preparation programs? So these, I'm using such a vivid voice to sort of try to convey <laughs> the strength that we saw in the language of many of these teachers. We had an 83% response rate. Um, so we feel pretty strongly that in this state, this is really what, you know, in a whole state, what supervisors are worrying about in their new teachers. Um, we don't know how generalizable it is. Um, maybe that's a, a comment that you could share or possibly a research study that you could conduct in your own uh, locality to figure out what the supervisors think need to be done. Maybe that can modify um, and answer some of these questions. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Dwayne and he'll talk about assessment and lecture. <laughs> right, I won't be lecturing though. <laughs> but um, so one of the, the questions that we asked was, um, you know, do you agree uh, that learning style um, learning about assessment and mathematics is, is vitally important to preparing high quality mathematics teachers. You know, Gideon just told you about the appearance of blue and red and then this um, chart below you'll see um, there are lots of blues throughout but particularly in an ass assessment and technology. Um, those were the areas where you know we see the most blue. Um, the others, by the way, are history of mathematics, cultural mathematics, and philosophy of mathematics. Um, you know, you see some blue, but certainly not to the degree of, of blue in terms of uh, the role that assessment plays um, in preparation or should play and um, the use and knowledge of technology. Um, and this was very, um, again, um, we weren't surprised that assessment was, was important, but we were uh, a bit um, a bit surprised that the um, the magnitude of the importance um, and uh, and so um, this actually um, and and it was actually supported by other other questions throughout the um, our survey where um, open responses where um, they said assessment, we need more assessment. And then they were very, very specific about how and, and why assessment was important, particularly for new uh, teachers in, um, in their instruction. Um, let's go on to the second um, question that we asked, or, or another question that we asked was, and then we sort of, you know, asked about, um, the new mathematics uh, teachers and they're relying on lecture style and that whole stage to, stage on the sta stage, you know, and when we're thinking about the traditional, tra tra traditionally prepared teachers, uh, most of them are just coming out of college and um, they've seen a lot of this in their programs. Um, and, um, and so, you know, uh, I think it's, says a lot about how they ultimately um, perform in, in classrooms. Um, and the supervisors noted that, um, you know, content knowledge is important, but the content knowledge for teaching is really, you know, what's gonna make the difference. And also um, that the new teachers need to know math, but they need to know how to teach um, more so. And um, again, this particular um, sentiment we saw coming up over and over and over the, the importance of, you know, the content, you know, they recognize that mathematics, you, you need to have a basic understanding or more than a basic understanding of mathematics, but you need to know how to teach, you know, what are the teaching uh, styles that you're gonna use? And then again, it went right back to assessment. I'd like to read um, a couple of the quotes that are up you know, two of them are, are here for you. Uh, content knowledge versus content, uh, content knowledge versus content knowledge for teaching are two very important things. And also, you know, they, the te new teachers know math, but they don't know how to teach. Um, another um, response 
um, that was very interesting to us was um, they seem to try to mimic college professors in that they just toss out information and expect kids to learn it and get frustrated when students do not learn. They don't know how to teach all students and the all was um, a parenthetical um, and seem to only know how to reach students who succeed no matter who is, who is the teacher. And we certainly, you know, if we think about our own um, colleges and universities and about our mathematics um, sort of classrooms that our, our, our prospective uh, teachers are in, um, you know, I think that we can reflect on how can we improve those experiences so that this, that it's not so pervasive in terms of um, you know, uh, the teaching styles for, for our new teachers. Um, again, pedagogy is important. Um, they thought that the role of veteran teachers and teachers knowing how to actually apply um, the different strategies for meeting all students was vitally important. Um, and again, assessment, assessment, assessment. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about formative assessment later, but um, many times throughout our survey, um, respondents said that of all the things that student, that new teachers need, they need to know how to use formative assessments for instruction and for improving their own uh, instruction, but also for helping students learn in their classes. Um, so uh, we will move on. I'll be talking about the math content that the supervisors thought was highest priority. Um, just to add on to this, one of the suggestions that the supervisors had for us uh, in terms of when we asked, how can we improve preparation programs? They commented on making sure that there are really great role models within the field experiences and student teaching experiences of the candidates as they're doing doing out in the field in the in high schools and middle schools as well as trying to find some excellent college university instructors who use more of a style that's consonant with right. the active learning classrooms so that was another that was a mentioned by several you know that wasn't a consensus or anything but Dwayne and I thought it was pretty interesting that several uh, a, a nice percentage several uh, of the supervisors spoke up on that theme. Uh, they also spoke up on the theme of uh, math content, right? One of their questions <laughs> phrased in a pithy way is why so much, why so <laughs> many math courses, right? I simplified it to that to help it <laughs> hit your brain. Um, they really, they really had much less than a math major in mind. Um, I know the font is a little bit small. I hope you can follow along, but um, the five courses listed in bold are the courses that got a majority full support. In other words, down here at the bottom where you can just barely see the bars, you can't see any titles, but those places where you have very tall blue bars was where we had a majority of full support for these courses as part of the program. And um, you'll see they're pretty basic. Mm -hmm. Two of these courses are below the level of calculus. Um, calculus wasn't even on the list, I'd like to point out. So college algebra trig, they're on the way to calculus. Statistics and geometry are lateral <laughs> to calculus, let's say. And we specifically probed, uh, would you think that a basic stats course is enough? or a full stats course equivalent to an AP level course. Right. Uh, the majority had full agreement that a basic stats course would be enough. And the same with geometry, just a college geometry course, or do you need a modern geometry course with non-Euclidean geometry and axiomatic reasoning and a very strong emphasis on proof? Again, the majority felt were in full agreement that just a college geometry course would be enough. One that was unexpected, and you can kind of see the, that <laughs> unexpectedness in the way I listed the courses out, is uh, that, oh, sorry, <laughs> that tall blue column about halfway through, that was math modeling and applications. And that was seized upon, as you can see, that is a tall blue bar. Right. 
that was very much seized upon by the supervisors as something they would have loved to see more of in um, their students, their new teachers preparation programs. Um, I find it interesting. I, when I see that course, I, you know, like most mathy people, I think linear regressions and chi-square tests and um, differential equations. So I'm, my, you know, my mind is at least in stats too and, and calculus too. But at least in their minds, it sounds like it's math modeling using, let's say, trigonometry, basic algebra. Um, maybe, I don't know, discrete methods uh, executable on Excel or other spreadsheets. I really don't know. We didn't get to that level of detail, but clearly they're not thinking about the math modeling or math applications at the junior or senior level that, you know, you might take with a physics major if you're a, an applied math major. It's a different kind of course that they had in mind. Right. And, and you know, remember that with this survey, we really wanted them to think about beginning teachers. So we're not saying, you know, we, we didn't have the intention of saying, thinking about the entire universe of mathematics teachers and, and um, you know, sort of what they need. I think that um, it's important to remember that we're, we're really focusing on those beginning teachers and what do you need to be, you know, successful and uh, right out of, uh, you know, going into the classroom. Yeah, and it's certainly true. Big, big schools tend to need, you know, instructors of AP statistics and AP calculus and I, I don't expect anybody who's teaching that shouldn't have less than two or three or four stats courses and two or three or four calculus courses. So that is definitely a different, uh, different kind of uh, teacher. Uh, but that's maybe also where the agreement and strong agreement comes in. Because when you look at uh, courses that got majority support, that's agree and strongly agree then you see a little bit more um, of the traditional list, the integral and differential calculus. So that got majority support. There's two more courses. Finite discrete math, that's maybe a little bit into the spreadsheets I was talking about, logic. Uh, you know, I, we gave some content examples as we surveyed to, so they could uh, make a good judgment of, of what we meant by finite or discrete math, because that, that also varies institution to institution. Right. Linear algebra got majority support and numerical analysis by a thin margin got majority support. Um, so that's five more courses. Um, so if you do rough numbers, 15 credits got full support and about 30 got majority support. Now, a given that's six credits below the level of calculus. And if you wanted to you know, count your calculus courses as four or five, maybe your trig for four. Um, it might be a little bit more than 15 or 30 credits, but that's certainly just barely a Bachelor of Arts, maybe with 30 or 32. And certainly not a Bachelor of Science, which in most places is 45, 48, something like that. Um, and almost certainly pre-calculus and above. If not, calculus and above is the only thing that counts. The um, we had a, a wide variety of, of comments um, when we asked about, you know, what's the use of these? You know, why do you think they're useful? Why do you not think they're useful? Are any of these particularly useful and so on? And I've included a couple of the, the really strong quotes. And the first one, it's kind of a killer, right? I'm more likely to have an issue with a teacher who knows the math, but not the kids. That's the essence. They're really not looking for somebody who loves the math more than they love the kids. I mean, that might be appropriate for elementary school teachers and, you know, we could have a discussion about middle school teachers, but at least these supervisors of high school teachers, you know, they still believe that the teacher needs to love the student more than the mathematics. And I think that's what drove some of this feeling this full support of only 15 credits. I think they'd really rather see somebody who's got social skills and, and we didn't include these in quotes, but we saw it come up again, you know, um, realistic, uh, realistic expectations of the students, the ability to be flexible, um, professional behavior, and these sort of, uh, 
I don't really want to say soft skills, but I guess in a business environment, you might call those the soft skills versus the hard skill of the mathematics that you're a teacher of. Um, one person was rather vivid in their commentary. Algebraic topology, eigenvectors for a high school math teacher. I'm adding my own tone, but I don't <laughs> think I'm reading much into this comment. I wonder if courses and topics like that drive candidates from the profession. Right. And I think that's, that's a really biting question because we do know, right? We do know that we need more math teachers. And uh, at least in my experience, the accrediting bodies and individual states are not really backing off of saying more and more math makes the teachers better. And I'd just like to point out that doesn't seem to be the overall feeling of the survey respondents. Um, I think, Dwayne, I think you and I agreed reading the comments when we read through, we kind of felt like there was one person who was content before everything else. Right. Yeah. And the other 19, that was our 83% response rate, were leaning much more in the other direction, yep. content after everything else. All right, so that is what I've got to say about content preparation. Um, what's next for the team? Uh, I'll, I'll take the first bullet and I'll hand over the rest uh, to Dwayne, or uh, do you want to handle the slide after this, Dwayne? I can, I'll just do the rest of this slide. Great. Um, <laughs> the first thing we want to say is we'd be really excited to help you do something like this locally. Even if you're not a math uh, teacher trainer, um, or if, if science is your thing, we have a Google survey out there. We can tell you where the messy parts were. Uh, we can hand the text over to you and you can do something very similar, math, science, anything that 100K and 10 serves in the STEM field. I think if you're excited by this kind of thing, either uh, talking yeah. to the consumers who know those new teachers in order to help you figure out how to make a better program to serve your community, we would love to help you out. So find us. Our contact information is on the last slide. Yes. Over to you, Duane. <laughs> yes. And so, um, likewise, we also have a few other, you know, fish completing um, activities that we need, we need to do. Um, we are in the process of completing our paper that will be presented to um, the 100K and 10 uh, team and then shared with the network. Um, but we'd also like to find out, you know, find conferences or, or meetings that um, we can actually engage uh, the community in this conversation and share what we've learned from this particular um, uh, set of, of um, responders in terms of uh, this survey. Um, and then we want to, you know, maybe take uh, a little time to do all that and then um, in, in a year or so um, come back to 200 to Canton with sort of where we are with the work and, um, and then see what the next iteration would be. Um, as Gideon said, uh, we started out a totally different um, uh, sort of thought process in terms of where we were going, but I think that um, in the end, it, we have some very useful information um, that we can actually um, build on from here and that can be used um, uh, practically now. So, um, and it's from a, a, a group of people who are, um, who probably know new teachers more, better than anyone else because they actually work with them as the uh, math supervisors. They see uh, the math uh, teachers and, uh, and their uh, perspective is very important to the work that we do. It was, a, it was a happy circumstance that shifted the focus from sort of the internal, mostly university processes of creating a program to a, to a more I'd, I'd even say open-minded or, or data-driven perspective of, wait, let's not figure this out in the ivory tower. Right. Let's go ahead and ask the people who surveys the, you know, who supervise these new teachers, what, what's missing and really find out. And we, we feel privileged to have had access to all of the supervisors in a state and have gotten such a high response rate. And that's why we're so excited to help you out, <laughs> bullet one. We know you 
had some questions for us that you mailed in. We figured we would address those. Um, we have plenty of time for other questions if those come up also. Um, I'll, I'll take question. Uh, I'll take question one, Dwayne. I'll let you take two, mm -hmm. and then we'll flip a coin <laughs> over three. Well, actually, we know the answer to three. Which yeah. Is, you want to support this project, then implement it locally. Even if you're a tiny little college and all of your student teachers go to one place and you place teachers only locally in like five high schools, this could be great. This could be great for you to really find out what the details of what those schools think about your new teachers to really find out, hey, are there some gaps that we can fill in? Um, this was a very astute question. Somebody asked about the tension between advanced math classes and math pedagogy courses and how do we do both and, how do we do both of these? Um, my initial answer is kind of wry and sad and sarcastic. I don't have a great answer because when we went through our last round of state and national accreditation, we discovered that the standards had changed and we needed to add five new courses. We needed to add three pedagogy courses and two content courses to remain compliant with um, states uh, the, the highest standards that states have, remember we license all across the country, as well as the standards that um, CAPE has. Uh, we also had to modify two other courses to include new content. So that's a lot. Um, in fact, part of the transition that we went through is we realized, hmm, we really do have a Bachelor of Science degree. And so we started offering a BS. Um, in mathematics education, not a BA, to respect the fact that the major um, really has become commensurate with what most institutions call a BS, 45, 50 credits. So I don't have a great answer as to how to balance these, but I'll let you in on what we, what we tried to do. We tried to take those math pedagogy courses and ground them in content. So instead of focusing on, for example, a, a, a purely history of math course, or a purely assessment course, or a purely technology and math course, although we do have those, in the new courses that we developed, we had a content focus. So pedagogy, uh, 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 teaching of statistics, teaching of calculus, teaching of geometry, where, or math uh, or geometry for teaching, calculus for teaching, we did sort of a blend of those. So we would touch on advanced, some advanced topics in geometry, calculus, algebra, statistics, while also talking about how to teach, maybe even how to teach advanced topics that might not, not show up in the classroom, but an emphasis on Let's learn really deeply about these concepts that maybe you just used in algebra or stats. Let's get a deep understanding of that. And we have the students write pedagogically oriented papers, give pedagogically oriented presentations based on that deep, deep understanding of um, those topics in basic stats, basic algebra, basic geometry. So we took content for teaching, not as advancing the content knowledge like you would in upper level courses, but more like deepening your knowledge in the older content. So that's one way to, to do a little bit of both and. We, we weren't quite able to figure out how to maybe integrate all of our pedagogy courses into these content pedagogy courses, which would have been more efficient but we are looking at the next iteration of our program to be more efficient and to explore deeper parts of the basic content that teachers will use in the classroom, but have them learn more deeply than they would teach in the classroom, but in a way that will still inform 
they're teaching. So that's the best I can give as an answer for one. Uh, we didn't do it well. We're going to do it better next round. And find me if you want to talk about developing those kinds of courses. I've got colleagues uh, that were primary developers, and I helped them out. I can get you in contact. They did a good job. Dwayne, your 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 show. So um, our take on question two, the the balance question, is a it's a a, a huge challenge, I think, for both K-12 and IHEs um, and um, one key factor I think in, in striking that balance is um, opportunities to, to uh, partner together around teacher training. Um, wanna, you know, oftentimes you think of, you know, uh, we think of teacher training in terms of pre preparation uh, for pre-service all happening at the university. Um, but I think that early field experiences where you're embedding some of these ideas is, is vitally important. Also, um, having people like math supervisors and, um, you know, cooperating teachers into high eight um, institutional uh, sort of uh, the, um, the teams. So each university usually has a has a um, a leadership team around teacher preparation, and I think that really engaging your local LEA, um, you know, the, the supervisors um, or the people who are in charge of the cooperating teacher uh, is a way to to get at both those big ideas that um, we have uh, for um, you know preparation and and sort of the broad sense, but um, you know, really helping to develop uh, strategies that will be uh, applicable and also that will be long lasting. Um, the key is going to be collaboration with those LEAs. Um, and this is coming from the IHE perspective, um, having opportunities for the LEAs to be part of the program and designing the program, designing the experiences for the um, teacher candidates, um, which is, you know, that's something that we don't often do in terms of reaching outside of ourselves as universities and colleges um, to that IHE perspective. Um, and as we've shown today, they have um, very, very interesting and important ideas about um, how and, and when, um, particularly assessment, um, use of technology, how much math or, you know, content and math pedagogy, how do you do that? Um, so I think that having opportunities to really engage the K-12 community in preparation uh, more concretely is, um, is a way to, to help strike balance, but I think that it's also ongoing. So it, it's not one of those things that you fix it on Monday and you know, it's good until you know, forever. I think that we have to keep revisiting it uh, because um, uh, the students change, schools change, and so if our, if our preparation doesn't change, um, then we are preparing teachers for uh, schools that don't exist anymore. So um, that's what I would say, um, and particularly as uh, being part of our team, I think that if we'd had more uh, K-12 engagement, um, I think we would have, Gideon and I and the rest of the team members, I uh, our discourse could have been a little bit richer, maybe a lot richer if we had uh, more engagement from uh, K-12. Yeah, we were initially overly ambitious and wanted to interview as many of these 20 as we could, but um, we ran out of time and energy and uh, focus to be able to do that because of our regular jobs. But it really, I, I hope our open response gave us a little bit of that feel. You know, we when we convey emotion, I think we're being authentic to the emotion that was intended when the text was written, but it really would have been valuable to have done a more qualitative project, which is much more intense, of course, or to have just had those kinds of people helping us design. So again, right, how can you support? You can find those kinds of people who you know that are excited by this and uh, send them our way. Uh, by the way, this is your time for questions, for complaints, challenges, any ideas you've got. And uh, I'll just, uh, I'll leave it on the next slide with our content information, our contact information, while I, while I invite you to go ahead and come off speaker or 
type in the chat. Uh, no question is too small. We have plenty of time and uh, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by, by uh, responses. If we are, we'll be happy to continue the conversation by email. And by the way, if you happen to be watching a recorded version, email both of us. We'd, we'd love to help out, respond to challenges, uh, brainstorm, help you start a local project like this on your own. Anybody live here today have questions? How did you uh, get uh, your sample of participants to take the survey? Dwayne? So, um, that's a good question. We, um, we re actually reached out to the, um, we started with our state department and um, this was sort of a, um, an opportunity that we had. Our, this particular state brings all of their uh, math supervisors together um, periodically. And so we went, went to um, the state and asked if we could actually approach them. We had this idea that we wanted to get, you know, gain, uh, this information and would uh, they be supportive and they were actually very supportive and they um, el actually helped us create the, uh, the survey. They actually helped uh, edit the survey survey and uh, um, and so that's how we recruited uh, the uh, participants. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also did the administrative portion of simply forwarding the link and and sort of putting their encouragement behind it letting letting the supervisors know that this was something from the main office that had been vetted was interesting and really would be something uh useful to contribute to so it wasn't like we were two you know two researchers parachuting out of nowhere right. we were known to people who were trusted by the supervisors um so i imagine if in your own state you wanted to do the same kind of thing you probably want to talk talk to people until you found a contact, or if you're starting from the raw, you'd want to look up the State Department of Ed and find out who supervises the supervisors and say, hey, I'd like to do this kind of thing. What do you think? Thanks for the question. Great. Uh, thanks for the answer. Was there any discussion of, in addition to courses that that currently exist that they should not take and topics they should not have, uh, were there any, any discussion of maybe possible math courses that are missing from our, the usual curriculum? Maybe, maybe I'm thinking of things that just focus on problem solving and and, and some things courses that because all these courses are all, are cut from the framework to prepare students to do other things. Was there any discussion about math content courses uh, that could be developed for teachers? Um, I'll have to, we'll have to wait till we more deeply analyze the, the qualitative responses, the open-ended responses in that area. Um, it's sort of something's tickling my mind that one or two of them made suggestions about instead of, but it was, there wasn't a large theme. If there was a large theme, I think it would have shown up. Um, we would have noticed it. So, so no, I don't think there was a large theme. But when we have the final report, you know, I'll make sure that it includes, uh, if there were any, um, not quite majority themes, but interesting ones, right. I'll bring that up. So that's a very good question. We, we really, we gave them the opportunity. Anything missing? What do you think is most important? Um, you know, what would you want to see? So I right. do think if that was a general feeling, it would have showed up. And that's also something that, you know, in an interview, uh, con con um, we could have actually probed a bit more. And um, that would have been, if there were something, ideas around that, I think that would have been in the format that that would have percolated up. Um, but as Gideon said, nothing um, sort of from, from what we're thinking uh, bubbled up from the survey. I think um, if I was in higher education in the state where these supervisors came from, I would probably look at those 30-ish credits. And if 
my higher education institutions were offering, let's say 36 or 45 credit math teacher degrees, I'd probably look at that difference and then figure out what courses do the supervisors think should be filled in. So maybe, maybe your question would be um, something that I would try to answer at the next phase where I'm actually trying to re fully redesign the program right. to, you know, to be a BS or, you know, a BA, uh, the, the proper number of math credits. But I would start with the 15 that the supervisors strongly agreed on. And then I'd fill it in with, let's just say, uh, a variety of creative courses right. inspired by the supervisors and practitioners out there. I wouldn't necessarily try to fill it in with what you usually fill in a math major with. Um, certainly enough to fulfill um, whatever national accrediting body your institution's going for, and certainly enough to fulfill whatever state standards, if any, are published. But beyond those two, creative as possible, based on, again, empirical data, not just the opinions of those creating the degree program, but based on empirical data. That's an excellent, that's another excellent question. Thank you. I would, I would guess problem solving in math would be there, but I wonder what that, you know, what that would mean. Hard to tell. I'd love to fill in a math major with things that are really, really useful for teachers. <laughs> uh, not that upper level courses aren't useful for many, many things, but apparently these supervisors don't think a wide variety of those upper level courses are worth teaching quality. It's an interesting challenge to try to meet. Good, we still have several more minutes in case anyone wants to ask anything else. You can type in the uh, chat if you're in a louder place and don't wanna have us hear the background. Uh, we do have a question from the chat. Uh, Sonia asks, any information gathered from the project that speak to how the best, how to best support the continuing education and professional development of teachers? Um, indirectly, we really were very, very interested in new teachers and having our supervisors reflect on how did the preparation program serve your new teachers? But I think many of their suggestions for improvement and some of their laments about what was missing um, would inspire topics for continuing education and professional development. I mean, some of them were a little, simple, like uh, this seemed like, uh, I think, Dwayne, we saw two or three times, uh, professional demeanor and behavior, right. sort of proper boundary making with the high school students and maybe a little bit of commentary about social media um, awareness. <laughs> so, you know, that might be a professional development that's quite, quite appropriate for new teachers. You know, certainly we would hope our more experienced teachers have already matured through that. Right. And, and I think I think we could probably deduce a few other places that they felt things might be improved now <laughs> while they're new teachers as opposed to in the preparation program. But um, I think role models would be one thing that came out strongly. Role, you can hook up you can hook up new teachers with great role models while they're teachers. Make sure they have the time and the desire or requirement to go visit teachers that are truly modeling the best behaviors, that are anti um, sage on the stage, that are anti lecture and manage to do it effectively even with the constraints of whatever state exams are coming around. So I, th I think that would be a, a, one of the themes that we saw. Um, the power of role models, um, particularly role models in excellence in teaching that isn't lecturing. 
thank you for the question. Yeah, that is a great question. And I think that um, Sonia's question, again, speaks to the need to um, sort of break down the silos because continuing education and professional development of teachers, that's something that we often think about for the K-12 schools. Uh, but if the university programs are engaged in PD of existing teachers, that actually, you know, that information they gain from that experience can act, can feed into the program. And um, the two can decide what's best to be in, be in that program, the uh, pre-service program, and what, what should be, you know, more appropriate for the continuing education or professional development experience. Thanks again. We'll uh, hand the mic back over to our 100, 100K and 10 colleagues now. Thanks for, thanks for your attention and, and your interesting questions. Thank you so much, Gideon, Duane. Um, just so appreciate your leadership on today's webinar and sharing the work. Um, we're really excited to be able to share uh, the full written report of, of what you all have worked on over the past year. We'll send that to everyone who's here on the webinar today um, by email in, in a few weeks once that's finalized. So look forward to sharing more. So that last question that Sonia shared, we also, um, back in September, it feels like November already. So last month, actually, in September, um, there another project team um, led a session speaking about a, a framework for mentor teacher networks across the state, across their state. And so we can um, share a link to that as well, uh, just to, to th really thinking about um, what it what it takes to cultivate role models and, and, and mentorship relationships for for ongoing learning for teachers. So we'll, we'll share that as well. So uh, thank you again to everybody for, for joining us. We wanted to give a quick um, plug for the next. We have four remaining of 12 total webinars, and those are up here on the screen. Um, you can also find those at calendar.100kn10.org. But uh, if you take a look at your email inbox, you should have received a link um, to a feedback survey. And uh, we really would love your feedback. If you joined us today live on the webinar, it means a lot. We take feedback very seriously here at 100K um, and 10. And truly, the survey should take under two minutes. So uh, just a, a few multiple choice questions away from, from sharing your input on uh, what worked great and what you appreciated from today. And um, we'll be following up tomorrow by email uh, with you all to, to share a link. It says this team's output, but we'll share the link to this recording with you tomorrow and more in a couple weeks. Uh, but I want to extend our gratitude again to Dwayne and Gideon for, for leading us and um, to you all for sharing your feedback and for joining us and contributing great questions to the discussion. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you all. And thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.